I am very grateful to God for my heritage, and I love the fact that I grew up in the Church of Christ. When I say I grew up in the Church of Christ, I was in church my second week of life. My mother took me. I was born on a Sunday, and, and she took me to church on my third Sunday alive. I was only two weeks old, and I grew up with the church. I grew up in the church, and church has been a major part of my life. In fact, my grandfather, who helped raise me until I was nine years old, preached for over 60 years. had a tremendous impact on my life, and I'm so thankful for that heritage because of the commitment to the Word of God, to learning the Word of God, to living by the Word of God. I remember the slogans of our heritage, the Restoration Movement. We speak where the Bible speaks. We're silent where the Bible's silent. Let's call Bible things by Bible names. There's only one church, and let's all be Christians. Let's all be united. Let's get away with denominations and just be Christian and nothing more, nothing less. You know, that's all I ever wanted to be as I was growing up, just a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less. Not a Baptist Christian, a Methodist Christian, an Episcopalian Christian, a Catholic Christian, a Pentecostal Christian, any other kind of crowd. Have a Church of Christ Christian. I just wanted to be a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less. I still love that message. Let's just be Christians. Let's just follow Jesus. Let's unite in the Word of God. I'm grateful for all of that, but when I say we speak where the Bible speaks and we are silent where the Bible is silent, actually what happened when I was a child was we spoke where the Bible speaks, we explained it where it was silent, and we even explained it where it wasn't silent, we just explained some things away. And one of those things is a critical, core, essential part of the gospel of Jesus. And I say that, and again... I love my heritage, but some of you are going to relate to what I'm talking about. Others of you have no clue. Uh, maybe, maybe this is your first experience with churches or your first experience in a Bible study or you're very young in the faith and you, you haven't had an opportunity to learn some of the things that we who learn some of these things had to relearn or are still in the process of relearning. But one of the things that is, I, I mean, when I say one of the things that is critical, can I say it this way? This is a core essential part of the gospel of Jesus that we actually missed. Not only did we miss, we explained it away. Not only did we explain it away, we explained it out of the Bible. And what I'm talking about is the Holy Spirit of God. When we look at the Holy Spirit of God, when we consider the Spirit of God, our, our heritage, some of our heritage anyway, some of you can relate to what I'm talking about. We were told that Jesus had the full measure of the Spirit. The apostles had the apostolic measure of the Spirit. The first century Christians had the baptismal measure of the Spirit. And we today have the Word measure of the Spirit. We were told the Spirit doesn't do anything that the Word doesn't do. And the Word doesn't do anything that the Spirit doesn't do. The Word of God is all we need today. This is, and I remember hearing my grandfather say from the pulpit, this is the only Spirit of God I need. But then as I read the book that the Spirit of God wrote through 40 different authors over 1,500 years in three different continents and two different languages, did you get all that? Over 40 authors during the time of 1,500 year time span, three different continents, two different languages, and then including Aramaic and, and Daniel, a little section. And yet it's all about one person, Jesus. And when we look at the book which is a collection of 66 books that the Spirit of God authored, and he talks about himself there and the necessity of the Spirit of God in our lives, we miss it. What do you talk about, Kev? Well, I grew up hearing this, and, and some of you did as well, that the Spirit doesn't do anything that the Word doesn't do. Well, actually, the Spirit intercedes for us, Romans chapter 8. The Spirit convicts us of sin. You say, well, the Word does that. No, the Spirit of God does that. And, and uh, the Spirit fills us. Well, the Word fills us. Yes, that's true. But we can grieve the Spirit of God. You can't grieve the Bible. And by the way, if a dog were to eat my Bible, he doesn't have the Holy Spirit. No, the, the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is the author of the book. The Holy Spirit is, is God. And he is God. In the same way that Jesus is God and the Father is God, so is the Spirit God. And perhaps we'll have an opportunity to look at and examine that. In fact, I will make a special video, and I'll, I'll give you a link to that, so that you will see at least one person's explanation of the Trinity. How the three are one and the one are three. That the one God is made up of three and they're each God, and yet we don't have three gods. We've only got one God. How can that be? 
Well, like I said, I'm going to explain that at a different time, and I believe you're going to benefit from that. But right now, our focus is on this. What is the Holy Spirit's role in the life of the Christian? Well, maybe we, we ought to examine is our own family history. I mean, our spiritual family history. Let's look at the life of Jesus in the book of Luke. I love the fact that the elders of the Benville Church of Christ has told us we're going to be studying through the Gospel of Luke and pulling from Luke stories, events from the life of Jesus, wherein we can find hope, assurance, confidence to deal with the stresses and difficulties of our lives, to face the future with an assurance of the presence of God, the power of His Spirit, and the hope that is set before us that things are going to get better because we're walking hand in hand with God. So I love the fact that we're studying through the Gospel of Luke, and right now we are just past the birth of Christ and the baptism of Christ. We're at a point now where Jesus himself is going to talk about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's role in his life. What I want us to do today is look at that and then draw some very specific applications to our own lives. So I believe that by the end of this lesson, a very short time we're going to spend in Scripture, but by the end of this lesson, you're going to understand more clearly your identity, the connections that you have, the relationships you have with other Christians. You're going to understand the power that is yours because of the Holy Spirit and your anointing by the Holy Spirit of God. Your filling by the Holy Spirit of God. Your empowerment by the Holy Spirit of God. And the boldness that is available to you and to me because of the, the presence, the dwelling of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. So before we actually read the scripture, this is in Luke chapter 4 again. Before we actually read the scripture, what I want us to do is take a moment and pray, all right? Father in heaven, thank you for giving us the Bible. How the Bible explains to us who you are, who we are, our history, the mess that we're in and why we're in the mess that we're in. Thank you that the Bible not only explains that, but also shows us your love and your concern. But most importantly, through the written word, we have come to know the living word. Thank you that the Bible reveals to us the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And as we have surrendered our lives to him, we want to live and learn how to live and how to love from him. Thank you for you coming to move into our lives by your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for filling us, empowering us, and giving us all of the promises that God has ever intended for his people. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name and to your glory that we pray these things. Amen. Okay, Luke chapter 4. Jesus comes to Nazareth. Now, this is significant because he doesn't live in Nazareth anymore. Even though he's called Jesus of Nazareth, that's because that's where he grew up as a child. But in his later years, as a young adult, or maybe even after his baptism, he moved to Capernaum. That was his home base. In fact, it's called his home. Whenever he went home to his home in Capernaum, that's in Mark chapter 2, and I think it's also in the book of Luke. But Jesus went to a synagogue that was the synagogue of his childhood. And while he was there, he was given an opportunity to read from the prophets. Now, when you came into synagogue, you took your place, and someone would lead in prayer, another person would lead in prayer, another person would lead in prayer. They would read from the scriptures. Five different men would read from the books of the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then someone would read from the prophets. Then they would expound on that in Aramaic. So Jesus is going to read either from the Greek Septuagint or the Aramaic or probably Hebrew and then explain what he read in Aramaic. Now, here's what he read from. He was given the scroll. <laughs> you can ask, why was he get, given the scroll? Why was he seen as a leader? Well, there's a lot of stuff that's happened in his past that we're going to address in just a minute. But he'd become a very popular person because he'd been teaching in other synagogues in the area within four to ten miles of where Nazareth is. He had been performing miracles. He'd been in Cana at a wedding and had changed water to wine. He'd driven out the tax, uh, not the tax, those are the money changers in the temple. And he, he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And John says, by this he was referring to his body. He's had interaction with Nicodemus already. 
Uh, he's been healing the sick and casting out demons, and his popularity is spreading. Now he's in Nazareth. They've asked him to read scripture and to speak. And the scroll that they gave him was in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 61. And significantly, this is the very passage that describes his ministry. <laughs> And I love it. it. You said, well, what a coincidence. Yeah, right. What a coincidence. Jesus opened the scroll and began reading from Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 1. And here's what it says. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And you can hear a hint of excitement in his voice as he concludes this section of Scripture. Then Jesus gave the scroll back. He rolled it back. He gave it back to the attendant. He went up and sat down in the seat that was for the expositor, the preacher. And what happened then... When he sat down, the people were already standing out of reverence for the Word of God. That's why he was standing when he read the Word of God. Then he sits down as the teacher, and they all remain standing. So we've reversed that 2,000 years later, haven't we? But he wrote back the scroll, gave it to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. I can just see him sitting there pausing looking at everyone very seriously, and he begins his message with these words. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now it says, he began to say to them, which tells me that Luke, the only thing that's important about the message as far as Luke is concerned for his readers, us and his first readers, the only thing that's significant to him is that this part of the message is what Jesus wanted to communicate. And the rest of the expounding upon this is why that's true about him. He said, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Well, all spoke well of him and marveled at his gracious words, the words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, isn't this Joseph's son? Now pause here just a moment. I want you to notice a couple of things. Number one, he reads from the passage of Isaiah, Isaiah 61, and this is an important passage of Isaiah, the latter part of Isaiah, where we know that Isaiah concludes his book with a message of hope, the hope of restoration of Israel, the hope of the coming of the Messiah, the suffering servant, the establishment of the kingdom. Isaiah is written to encourage the people of Israel who are about to suffer defeat. And... And Isaiah is encouraging them with a picture of what's going to happen 750-some years after their time. And that is the coming of the Messiah. So when Isaiah wrote, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me, and he's given me the ability to proclaim the good news to the poor, that's, that's true about him. He was anointed by God. But Jesus said, that prophecy is about me. I mean, this is fulfilled. It's completed in me. By the way, that's why Jesus is called, is called the Christ. Christ, the Greek word Christos, is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah, Messias, Mashiach. And Christos to Mashiach both mean the same thing, anointed one. That's why it's a title. It's not his last name. Joseph Christ and Mary Christ didn't have a baby boy named Jesus Christ, all right? It was Jesus the Christ, the anointed one. And whenever you choose to follow him, you are called a Christian, also an anointed one. Well, when was he anointed and how was he anointed? Well, it's funny that you ask that, and, and it's an important question that you should ask. Acts chapter 10, when Peter is explaining the gospel to Cornelius, he begins not at Jesus' birth, not at John the Baptist's birth, he begins not at Jesus being in the temple at 12. He, Peter, begins the message of good news at the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. And he refers to that as he was anointed by the Spirit of God and with power. 
And he went about proclaiming the kingdom of God and healing the sick by the power of the Spirit. Go back and read Acts chapter 10, and you'll see what I'm talking about. He was anointed at his baptism. But the thing is, this isn't Jesus' first experience with the Holy Spirit, is it? I consider this. Zechariah was filled with the Spirit whenever he prophesied over his baby boy John, whenever John was circumcised on the eighth day. John, the Baptist, the baptizer, John was filled with the Spirit inside his mother's womb. He was born full of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus is unique. God did something with Mary that's never happened before, has never happened since. It is a one-time-in-history activity. And yet, there's a similarity in what happened in Mary's life and what happens in our lives. Watch. Gabriel came to Mary and said, You're highly favored of God. And she was afraid. He said, don't be afraid. He said, you're going to conceive and give birth to a child, to a boy. And you're going to name him Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. And she said, how can this be? I'm a virgin. And Gabriel said that the Holy Spirit of God will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And you will conceive and give birth to a baby boy. For nothing is too difficult for the Lord. What's interesting is Mary's attitude at this point. She said, everything that you've said, let it be done to me. The handmaiden of the Lord. In other words, whatever you want to do with me, God, I'm willing. You do to me, do with me all that you have just said. I am a willing handmaiden of the Lord. And that should be our attitude as well. The Holy Spirit of God miraculously entered into Mary's life, and there was the Holy Spirit of God joined with the egg of Mary without the help of a man semen. That is, Jesus was born by a combination of the Spirit of God and the egg of a woman so that he was fully God and fully man. This is critical. If that's not true, hang up your hat and let's go home. I mean, seriously, this is, this is a major teaching of the gospel, that Jesus Christ is fully God, which is he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. If he's conceived by the Holy Spirit, but he's called the Son of God, that must mean that the Holy Spirit is, that's right, the Holy Spirit is God. Now, what's interesting to me is that John the Baptist was full of the Spirit in his mother's womb. He was filled with with the Spirit, but he wasn't conceived by the Spirit. Jesus is the only one who was conceived by the Spirit of God. He existed before creation. He's the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Everything that was created was created by him, and nothing exists except that he created it. John chapter 1, about the first five verses. Jesus existed before he was born, in contrast to John, and by the way, the rest of us. We did not exist before we were born. When the egg and the sperm joined, <laughs> there we are. And that's how it sounded, too, by the way. <laughs> All right? Now, when Jesus came into the world, he came into the world. And it was by the Holy Spirit of God uniting with Mary in her body in order for her to conceive and give birth to a son. It's a spiritual miracle. So Jesus wasn't born just full of the Spirit or filled with the Spirit. He was the Spirit of God in flesh. Wait a minute, Kev. Where are you getting that idea? I mean, that sounds heretical to me. No, 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 no. It's not. In fact, let me read. We're going to leave Luke for just a moment. I want you to see John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, Jesus is telling the apostles that they're going to receive the Holy Spirit of God. And then he calls him the helper. I want to start in verse 12. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this is what I will do, that this Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I'll do it. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another help, another helper, this is Jesus speaking of whom? Of the Holy Spirit. That's whom. To be with you forever. Another helper. You've had a helper with you now. I'm going to ask the Father to give you another helper. 
Even, verse 17, this is John chapter 14, verse 17. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, watch, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. He dwells with you and he will be in you. The spirit of God in flesh living with them, he would live in them. And by the way, when the New Testament authors are referring to the writers of the letters, Paul, Peter, James, John, when they're referring to the presence of the Holy Spirit, they often say, Christ is in you. In fact, Paul even says this in, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I, know, I promise we're going to go to John and back to Luke, but this is another digression, okay? Second, this is worth it, guys. you got to look at it. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And verse 17. Now, what he's saying is that we have the Holy Spirit of God who lives in us, and that's why we're able to look into the face of Jesus. Here's what he says about the Spirit of God, who has made us adequate as ministers or servants of the gospel. He's given us our adequacy. You say, I'm inadequate to tell people about the gospel. No, 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 you aren't. You have the Spirit of God. You have adequacy, ability, sufficiency, that you don't know about yet if you don't recognize that the Spirit gives you that. Now watch, verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and the Spirit is the Lord. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Yes, he has just said that Jesus is the Spirit, and the Spirit is Jesus. In fact, this is so complex. This is why we're going to take some time and, and look at this in greater detail and explain the Trinity, how the three can be one and the one can be three, and yet they're not three different gods. There's only one God. It'll make more sense to you in our next teaching. But I want you to see in Romans chapter 8, the last outside of Luke scripture we're going to look at. It's in verse 9. This is the Holy Spirit chapter of the Bible. Romans chapter 8. It is, this describes our life in the Holy Spirit. And by the way, I said earlier in this lesson that this is a core element of the teaching of the gospel. And if we don't get this right, we don't really have the good news of Jesus. This is why I say that. Look at verse 9. You, however, talking about the Christian, all Christians, you, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit. If, in fact, watch, the Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, it does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, it may sound confusing, but I want you to hear this. The Holy Spirit of God is referred to by three different terms. The Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. And then again, he's referred to as Christ in you and the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. That Spirit who lives in you, dwells in you. And if anybody doesn't have the Spirit of God living, the Spirit of Christ living in him or her, that person does not belong to Jesus. So here's my definition of Christian. It's biblical. We speak where the Bible speaks. We're silent where the Bible's silent. I'm just going to let, it, we're going to let this rest and let it hang. Here's what the Bible teaches clearly. A Christian is someone who is forgiven of all sins and has the Holy Spirit of God living inside. That's it. That's a Christian. When you are a Christian, Jesus makes you a part of his body, the church. And his body is the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Ephesians chapter 1, the last verse. Now we're back in, in Luke. Real quickly, I want you to see this. In Luke chapter 3, Jesus came to John the baptizer, his cousin, to be baptized. Matthew gives us a bit of the conversation. Matthew says that there's a, a conversation that takes place between John the Baptist and Jesus, where John says, wait a minute. I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. Because you see, John had figured this thing out, who Jesus is. He grew up hearing the story of the conception of Jesus being born of a virgin, his Aunt Mary, I mean, or his cousin Mary. And so here's the cousins, Jesus and John. And he says, you ought to be the one baptizing me. And Jesus said, no, let it happen this way. 
It will fulfill all righteousness. In other words, it's the right thing to do. Well, why is it the right thing to do? Well, maybe it's because of the washing of the sacrifice that's going to take place three years later. Maybe it's because um, maybe maybe it's because at this time is a statement of his surrender totally to the kingdom of God and to the will of God. And he, at this point, marks his beginning of ministry by a complete surrender, allowing someone to bury him. Now, obviously, it wasn't for forgiveness of sins, which is why John baptized everyone else, was so that their sins would be forgiven based upon their repentance, their change of mind. Yes, I am a sinner. I do want the kingdom of God, and I want to surrender to the kingdom of God. I want whatever that means. I want the kingdom of God. I want to be prepared for it. Okay, so they were baptized based on their repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus had no sin. So why was he baptized? We're given a clue in John chapter 1. The one who sent John to baptize told him, when you see the Spirit descend upon one like a dove and remain on him, that's the one who will baptize in the Holy Spirit. That's the one who is the Messiah. That's the Savior. He's the sacrifice. And John said, and I testify to you, I saw that happen. So I don't know if the crowds saw it as well, or if it was only John that saw the Holy Spirit of God descend in the, in the form of a dove and rest on the shoulder of Jesus and remain there. But it was in Acts chapter 10 that it refers to the baptism as the anointing of the Holy Spirit and power. This is significant. At that point then, while Jesus is praying, Luke chapter 3 says, he's standing in the water, he's praying, the Holy Spirit of God comes down on him in the form of a dove and rests on his shoulders, a signal to John, this is the one. And then God speaks from heaven, the Father speaks from heaven, and he said, you are my son. I am so well pleased with you. In other words, I am so proud of you. You're my son. After that, not like immediately out of the water, but shortly after that, Jesus was driven into this, the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tested by the devil. For 40 days he hadn't eaten, and the devil came to him and said, look at these stones, don't they look like bread? Won't you change these to bread? Change these stones to bread, don't be hungry. And Jesus said, if you're the Son of God, you can do that. If you're the Son of God, cast yourself down. If you're the Son of God, worship and all. He challenged him, if you're God's Son. Well, what did God just say at his baptism? What did Jesus grow up knowing? Except that God is his father. But now, as a human being, weak after 40 days of fasting, weak, wondering about his own personal ability as a human being, am I going to be able to make it? I don't know what he was, what he was wrestling with. I just know this. He was tested. He was tempted to do sin in every way that we are, yet he overcame. That's what Hebrews chapter 5 says. He was tempted in every way, like we. That means he had the desire to do wrong in every kind of sin that you and I face. Not just these three, because Luke tells us that the devil left him so as to come back to him at a more opportune time. The devil kept coming back at Jesus, because if he can get Jesus to sin one time, then God's plan is totally destroyed. He doesn't understand that Jesus is going to be crucified, and that's God's solution to our sin. And see, Satan thought that he was doing away with God's plan when he had Jesus crucified. If he'd understood the plan of God, it never would have happened that way. Okay, that's beside the point, too. But here's, here's what you see. He was born by the union of the Holy Spirit of God and Mary. He is spirit in flesh. He hears the word of God from the heavens. You are my son. I'm so proud of you. I'm so pleased with you. And then Satan says, if you're the son of God, do this, do that, do this. Challenging his identity. And then Jesus comes back to Nazareth after several months of proclaiming the good news and performing miracles and under the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus proclaims in that synagogue, the Spirit of God is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord, of Yahweh, is on me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty, to set the captives free. To, to heal the brokenhearted. Here's, here's what I want you to see. The Holy Spirit of God does exactly the same thing with us, beginning with our baptism. There's a similarity in, in this respect to our baptism in Jesus. We also surrender to the full will of God. We surrender ourselves to him as our Lord. That's what repentance means. You're saying in your life, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. Sin, you're not going to rule me anymore. 
And then you're buried with Christ in baptism, into his death. And as you're raised up out of the water, like he was raised from the dead, you're raised to live a new life. He died, was buried, and was rose again. You die, and you're buried, and you're raised again. And two things happen to you that are somewhat similar. Jesus was already filled with the Spirit because he was the Spirit in flesh. But now, he's anointed by the Spirit, and the Spirit is on his shoulder. So the Holy Spirit of God comes to live in you. This is that you're surrendering when you're baptized. The Spirit of God comes to live in you. And secondly, very important, the Spirit of God empowers you and you are called from that day forward a child of God, a new creation. You have a new family. Huh, you've got a new family history to learn, don't you? You need to learn how the God of heaven has acted in your family all the way back to the days of Abraham and even before. When God made the covenant, you are part of a fulfillment of the covenant God made over 4,000 years ago to Abraham. It's so exciting to me. And I want you to see that what happened to Jesus was also happening to us and that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. So are you. You are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. He is a person. He is God. And now he lives in flesh once again. Your flesh. My flesh. We are his temple. We're the presence of the kingdom of God wherever we go. And what did Jesus say when he told the apostles? When the Holy Spirit comes on you with power, what was it for? Why did the Holy Spirit come on them with power? It wasn't just that they could speak in the tongues of men and all the rest. Of it. it wasn't because of that. It was so that you will be my witnesses. Starting in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the other most parts of the world. Jesus said, I was anointed by the Spirit of God to proclaim good news to the poor. You're anointed with the Spirit of God to proclaim the message of God to the world. And that is is where we share our story with Jesus' story. His history is our history in this way. And it's, why, by the way, how King Jesus comes to live in each of our hearts is through the presence of his Holy Spirit. I hope this has been encouraging to you, and there's so much more, so much more there that we could dive in and dig out and pull out and apply to our lives, but hopefully these things have given you a sense of clarity your identity, your purpose, your connection, your future, your power, your boldness. It's all wrapped up in the person of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. You're not of the flesh, but of the Spirit. You have the Spirit of Christ. If you don't, you don't belong to Him. And isn't that what you want? Do you want to belong to Christ? Just having the Word of God in your life doesn't make you belong to Christ. It's having the Spirit of God live inside you that makes you belong to Christ. Pray with me one more time, would you? Lord, today as we've looked into the scriptures and we've considered how you live in us by your spirit, I pray that you will take the rest of this week and remind us you're always with us. Help us remember that when we're afraid. Help us remember that when we're feeling anxiety. Help us remember that whenever we're feeling stressed out. Help us remember that when we're full of joy and celebration and great things are happening, like the birth of children and, and the happiness that we have with our family members and our friends and at work. And thank you for all of these things and that the fulfillment, the filling of all, all of those things, the full excitement and celebration of those things are even deeper and fuller because of your spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for claiming us as your own. And it's in your name. To your glory, Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Thank you for being a part of today's study.